Good morning, church. Good morning. It is good to be with you this morning. It seems it's been a while since I have been standing in this pulpit, but I am pleased and grateful for this opportunity because I have a few things to say. <laughs> I just got back from a vacation, church. I don't ordinarily take fun vacations. Well, excuse me, I visit relatives. <laughs> and we have our times, yes, yes. But, but this time, uh, the chief operating officer of our home, uh, I call her that because she does not want me to say her name, and I will not do that. But she's cool. The chief operating officer of our family said, let's go have some fun before we go see relatives. And I said, okay. And uh, of course, I said okay with some reluctance because I didn't know what the definition of fun meant to my chief operating officer. But she knew one thing about me that I will not turn loose. I am a baseball fan. I love baseball. Minor league baseball, major league baseball, it's me, right? So she said, you want to go to a major league baseball game? I said, well, of course. And so she said, let's go see the Texas Rangers. Well, okay, all right, you know, Rangers. They do have an African-American manager. <laughs> One of two, I think, in the major leagues. But they've been in the World Series often. So I said, okay, good, that's good. But knowing that I'm the only one in my family who likes baseball. I was still a little, well, how, how are we going to do this? Because we have two children who are teenagers, and they don't like to be around us anyway, <laughs> let alone a baseball game. But, but, but my wife said, okay, uh, let, let me go on the website and look at tickets and stuff. And she found the ticket place. And I said, by the way, darling, you know, the Rangers are one of a few Major League Baseball teams that have a section in their stadium that's called All You Can Eat. And she said, really? And I said, yes, you purchase a ticket and then it's All You Can Eat. And she found it on the website and she got these tickets. And she told the children, we're going to a place where you can eat all you want. And so they agreed, okay, yeah, let's go. <laughs> so there, they, there we were, the Davis family, sitting in the seats, surrounded by people who also wanted to eat all they could. And ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you, my experience is I stood up a lot as people went back and forth, back and forth. Joy was the person getting food for us, and she said, Oops, I called her name. <laughs> but the chief operating officer said, they gave me this shovel thing and I dug for peanuts for you. And so she would dip in the barrel and give me peanuts and hot dogs and hamburgers and chicken sandwiches and popcorn and all you could eat. So I thought about my sermon. <laughs> Gluttony. My friends, gluttony has to do with an insatiable appetite. Now, let me say very quickly that gluttony is not obesity. You know, sometimes we get the two confused, and we think because someone is plump, they're gluttonous. Not true. Obesity it's the state of being overweight. Now, one becomes overweight for various reasons, including improper nutrition, lack of exercise, and a chemical imbalance. All three of those are reasons, and sometimes they're combinations of someone being overweight. Now, if one is gluttonous, I believe you can be obese. But as I said, if you're obese, you're not necessarily gluttonous. 
See, gluttony has to do with attitude. It has to do with how you approach food. It has to do with how you think. And obesity is just the state of things. But because I like to deal with those areas that are dark, shadowy, unseen, and definitely not talked about, I got all into this gluttony thing. <laughs> I said, okay, all right, let's see. Gluttony is an old, old word. It's an ancient word. It's a word that people came up with to describe something that not just what they saw, but something that went into what they saw, right? So gluttony is ancient, and I want to bring us up to a place where we understand a little bit about that gluttony before I take off somewhere else. So let's go back here to this gluttony. You know, in my research on this whole seven deadly sins thing, I found that the seven deadly sins that Christians hold too dearly were actually appropriated from another source. Now, I don't know if the other speakers, I've tried to listen to the other preachers, but like I said, I was on vacation, so <laughs> I, I, I wasn't thinking about this so much. But let me share something with you. There was a uh, cult right around the first century, same time that Christians were getting together around who we are and who that guy Jesus was and we want to carry on the struggle that Jesus was doing. And so the early church was in the midst of a lot of other cults, hear me now, that were going on at the same time. And there was one called the Mithraeus, M-I-T-H-R-A-I-S-T. That's a person, ISM is what it was, Mithraism, Mithraism, because they were worshiping and led by Mithra. All right, so in this Mithraism, these were folks who dwelled in caves and they had their ceremonies inside the cave and they were set apart from the rest of people, right? But they had some interesting similarities to this thing called Christianity. Very interesting. Well, one of the things that they talked about is that when someone dies and there is this dead soul that is ascending to another place, a place of heavenly proportions, it has to pass through these different levels. And as they pass through these levels, they drop off that kind of countenance that what's around them because they are leaving this earth and moving on. So they would pass through these different uh, levels, these different heavenly orbs. So they, the dead soul begins the journey through the gates of Capricorn. And the dead soul moves toward the sun where, let's loose this thing called pride, moves on toward the moon where this thing called envy drops away, moves on toward Mars where anger falls aside, moves to Mercury where greed falls away, moves to Jupiter, Jupiter where ambition falls, and then Venus where lust reluctantly leaves. <laughs> and finally, through the rings of Saturn, although they didn't know they had rings in those days, where sloth drops. Those were seven evils that sound similar to the seven deadly sins. And this was in Mithraism. So I'm saying to you that maybe our burgeoning Christian folk looked over there at the Mithraeus and said, hmm, but did you notice that you didn't hear gluttony? No, the only one that wasn't there. But what you did hear was ambition. Ambition. So maybe our 
ancestors in the Christian tradition said, now, okay, uh, maybe there was some Jay-Z folks, you know. <laughs> they said, well, ain't nothing wrong with ambition. You know, I guess if you get too much, you might get fat. Well, that's what we'll get mad at. We'll get mad at the corpus body, the corporal, the, the, the plump. We'll just tag that and say, that's gluttony. Now, I'm just saying, maybe that was going on. But there, there was a time when people talked about Mithraism with a little bit more frequency than we do. As a matter of fact, a young seminarian wrote a paper in 1949, so it wasn't me. But in 1949, in his first semester of his second year of seminary, young Martin Luther King was in a class. And young Martin Luther King was reading about Mithraism, and he saw similarities. He saw, well, Mithra was born December 25th. Hmm. He said, well, look, there's also, they do baptism and meal sharing. That's very important sacraments for them. Hmm. He said, and, and, and you know, Sunday is their day of worship. Hmm. So he wrote this paper. Martin Luther King wrote this paper. And he talked about how the influence of Mithraism was to Christianity. And I want you to listen to our good sister, Reverend Tamara, as she reads two paragraphs from his extensive paper, which, by the way, his professor wrote. And by the way, you may ask, well, Gerald Davis, how do you know all this? <laughs> well, as my brother said, because of the internet, there is no excuse to be dumb. <laughs> so if you, go, if you don't believe me, go Google, and if Errol if Goodman is here, he's doing it right now. <laughs> but, but go ahead and Google Mithraism, comma, Martin Luther King, and you'll see the original paper that's at Stanford University because they have the Martin Luther King Jr., Education and Research Institute at Stanford, all of his papers, right, are at Stanford University, and they have scanned his paper with the comments from his professor. His professor wrote several glowing comments about this paper, but the thing that I'm taking away from this, he says, you know, you've done the research, you've done it, he says, but the one thing, you are a very good writer, and if you are willing to pay the price, you will go far. That's interesting. So I want Sister, S Sister Tamara to read his conclusion. It's only two paragraphs, so I want you to hear this. That Christianity did copy and borrow from Mithraism cannot be denied. But it was generally a natural and unconscious process rather than a deliberate plan of action. It was subject to the same influences from the environment as were the other cults and it sometimes produced the same reaction. The people were conditioned by the contact with the older religions and the background and general trend of the time. Many of the views, while passing out of paganism into Christianity, were given a more profound and spiritual meaning by Christians, yet we must be indebted to the source. To discuss Christianity without mentioning other religions would be like discussing the greatness of the Atlantic Ocean without the slightest mention of the many tributaries that keep it flowing. Wasn't that beautiful? He was just 25 when he was writing that. But he told the truth. See, this is what you learn when you go to seminary, but you don't hear it preached from the pulpit unless you're Unitarian. They, no, they didn't keep my papers. They, <laughs> They, they gave my papers back. They, they, they said, here, Gerald Davis, take these and hold them dear to you. <laughs> yes, they said, don't share, don't share. Although, 
Although I am proud, I did get an A plus in social ethics. <laughs> I'm very proud of that grade. I'm very proud of that grade. I was taught by a student of Reinhold Niebuhr, and he, uh, he said, I don't give A pluses, but young man, one day, little did he know. <laughs> So here's the deal. Dr. King, although then he was not Dr. King, he was just a middler. He was a middle in seminary. But he saw the truth of it. But he said, we, have, we cannot ignore the sources. It, you know, it, he's talking about the fact of let's be inclusive. Let's be inclusive. Don't be so exclusionary. Understand that, uh, that, that the 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 the, the Building of a tradition does not come down all at once. Boom, there it is. It's all there. But you're borrowing. There's cross-fertilization. All right? So if we get there, if we start from the standpoint of borrowing is good, people make decisions based upon their needs, now let's go back to those seven deadlies. Why was ambition kicked to the curb? And instead, we have gluttony. Well, maybe, just maybe, people didn't want to get too real. You see, ambition, and I'm talking about raw ambition. Raw ambition that says, I don't care what's in the way, I'm going after it. Raw ambition that says, yes, I'm the CEO. I want 500 times the amount of money that the worker is getting that I'm executive over. Raw ambition that says, I don't care that you may have the right way of doing things that most people will benefit. It's in my way because I want profit. I want money. Some rich people... <laughs> so this, this one guy, you know how it is when the, the servants start talking, you know, servants talk. So they talk about these rich people. For a man and his wife, who were very rich, head of a private equity investment fund, very, very wealthy, it costs $3,000 a day to prepare food for these people, just the two of them. $3,000 a day preparing food. Those, that's, I'm talking about blind ambition that says, I don't care. I want it. Now, we can't talk about ambition. Let's talk about gluttony. <laughs> gluttony. Because then what you think about are portly people. And then we get the fat jokes. And folks who are plump, or as I like to say, big and beautiful, BB, those folks get all self-conscious. No, I'm talking about the thing that goes into the mind where you would say, I don't care about you. I won't. Insatiable appetites. That's the gluttony I'm talking about. And it's closer to raw ambition than it is to obesity. You hear what I'm saying, church? I'm over on this side. It happens to be the left. That's all right. <laughs> so church, Mithraism slash early Christianity gave us some choices here. How we want to read uh, what we see, how we want to understand our environment. If we want to continue to be tied to a status quo that says, check the box, how tall, how, you know, the whole appearance aspect. If we want to be tied to appearance, then you are making a conscious decision that you don't want to know. You don't want to go deeper. You don't want to follow the trail. You don't want to confront raw power. You just want to exist and live. 
But is that really living? Is that really what we're called to do? You see, out of that tradition of Christianity that, that covers up a lot of question marks, you got to go all the way back and talk about the person who inspired this thing. That's why, right today, I'm more Unitarian than I am, quote unquote, Christian. And the reason why is that I, I'm, I'm through. I'm old enough to say I, I know what's going on. And I'm not following any creeds, edicts that ignore the insulting aspects of life in order to get along. I'm not doing it. And I don't want my children to do it. And I don't want anybody who's my friend to be a part of something like that. So I have found and pitched my tent in this place of big ideas with big tables that say, yes, let's ask the question. Let's push a little bit. So I want to push a little bit this morning because the revolutionary who started this thing was pushing. Let us not forget that. I wonder sometimes if Jesus did come back, would Jesus recognize his church? I don't think so. Jesus would say, wait, 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 whoa, 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 where did you all go? What happened? <laughs> I believe that because if you read what Jesus says about a whole lot of things, you say well, Jesus wouldn't be comfortable in these pews. Now, maybe in this church he might. Maybe he might be comfortable here because he'd be hearing something that sounded something like what he said. There was a passage in, in Luke. It was Luke 7, as a matter of fact. Luke 7. Somewhere around, um, somewhere around the 33rd, 35th verses, and I'm going to ask Sister Tamron to read the 36th to the 50th. But before she does that, I want to just say this. Jesus, I'm going to set this up for you. Jesus was in his ministry, and he was walking around doing what Jesus did, teaching and healing and talking straight to folks, and sometimes not so straight, so people said, what did he say? <laughs> you know, that's that parable thing, you know. So he, Jesus was doing what he did, and people were trying to figure him out, you know, and said, well, you know, he's, he's like that John the Baptist guy. Well, you know, John the Baptist had been out there in the wilderness, and, and John, John was, was different. I mean, you know, he, he, was, he, was, he was weird. But John kept saying, it's not about me. Somebody greater than I is coming. Somebody is greater than I is coming. Don't, don't get all caught up in following me. Wait a minute. He's on his way. And so Jesus, in playing on that, talking to the crowd, said, uh, you know what? See, from John the Baptist, John the Baptist has come. You say, well, John the Baptist who, who eats no bread and drinks no wine, and you say he has a demon. Then the Son of Man has come, eating and drinking. And you say, look, a glutton. A drunkard, friends with tax collectors and sinners. But you know what? He said, wisdom is vindicated when all her children, by all her children. You know that soap opera, All My Children? That's where it came from. Wisdom, that's the, that's the mother of the, of the children. Wisdom is vindicated. We used to say, it'll all come out in the wash, right? And that's what Jesus said, but that's all right. Later on, you'll see what I'm talking about. You call me a glutton and a drunkard because I eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners. And John the Baptist, who is not eating, eats no bread, drinks no wine, and you say he has a demon. Hmm. Now, that's, I say, I like people like that. I can handle that. But see, later when he said all these things and people were, were admiring and saying what he was saying, Sister Tamara is going to read a, the, the second part to this. And, and please understand, the, pers the Pharisees in this story, the 
Pharisees were the wise people, the lawyers, the ones who were better than, do I dare say, gluttonous. So this is what Sister Tamara is going to read to us. One of the Pharisees asked Jesus to eat with him. And he went into the Pharisee's house and took his place at the table. And a woman in the city who was a sinner, having learned that he was eating in the Pharisee's home, brought an alabaster jar of ointment. She stood behind him at his feet, weeping, and began to bathe his feet with her tears and to dry them with her hair. Then she continued kissing his feet and anointing them with the ointment. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw it, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what kind of woman this is who is touching him, and that she is a sinner. Jesus spoke up and said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. Teacher, he replied, speak. A certain creditor had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. When they could not pay, he canceled the debts for both of them. Now which of them will love him more? Simon answered, I suppose the one for whom he canceled the greater debt. And Jesus said to him, You have judged rightly. Then turning towards the woman, he said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she has bathed my feet with her tears and dried them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore, I tell you, her sins, which were many, have been forgiven. Hence, she has shown great love. But the one to whom little is forgiven loves little. Then he said to her, Your sins are forgiven. But those who were at the table with him began to say among themselves, Who is this who even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Go in peace. Go in peace. You see, church, when it comes down to it, we're all in this boat together. We're no better than the other. We are each other's company. We are brothers and sisters. I don't care how much money you have, you're going to die. <laughs> you know, maybe you can leave it to somebody. But if you have not had a thought about someone other than yourself, you probably won't. The bottom line, church, is that we are called to be a brother and sister to each other. Can we not think about something other than ourselves? Can we invest ourselves in a cause greater than ourselves? Can we not make that move, that transformational place that said, I'm not about appetite, I'm not about feeding something insatiable, chasing some wet dream. Oh, yeah, I can preach like that. This is a Unitarian church. <laughs> what I'm about is making sure that everything I have is going to go toward a better world. I'm going to touch people with the love that is inside of me. I'm going to give people the hope that may be resting and not quite alive. I'm going to rise up and say injustice. When there is injustice anywhere, what is it? There's no justice. We have to be able to say to the powers that be, your insatiable appetites are coming to an end. Sometimes, church, when you feel like you're the only one, understand this, that we are moving rapidly, but it's a snail's pace. And so it may not always happen as quickly as we would like it, but we are coming up against an order that is going away. And just like those waters that are falling on rock is wearing it away because we have love, church, 
and love will win every single time. It will put it to rest, those that will rise up against us, because we are meeting that challenge with the love that has been given to us by divine spirits, the spirit that will make us whole, church. I'm preaching this morning about something that is not about Insa- well, it's not about insatiable appetite that makes you big. It's an insatiable appetite that wears you out. An insatiable appetite that leaves you alone. An insatiable appetite that makes you hungry still. Church, it's not about the money. So don't feel guilty if you have more than I do. I'm glad for you, but I want you to understand this. You have to move that money to a place that's going to benefit others. You got to be that way. And that's the leadership this church provides to the rest of this community. When we give away the offering, I am still stunned by that. Give away the offering. Churches are marveling at all souls because it gives away its offering. It says, in fact, we're not gluttonous. We are children of God, and we love hard. Church, that's my sermon. Are we together? Amen. Amen.